Hello. You're listening to Muscle Science for Women, everybody's favorite Muscle Science for Women podcast. I'm your host, Everybody's Ashley. favorite podcast, <laughs> not Muscle Science for Women podcast. Uh, everybody's listen, favorite podcast. If this was everybody's favorite podcast, we could quit all of our other jobs and yeah. just do this. So we're not everybody's favorite podcast yet. There's hope, I guess. We're doing yet. all right. Keyword yet. We're doing all right. Um, how about we just skip, skip the small talk and just dive right into the questions. Okay. Cause Let's when we do, do it. when we do small talk, sometimes we go off the rails. Not that there's anything wrong with that. All right. Yeah. We got some good questions. Let's dive Let's into do it. it. Let's do it. Okay. This question is from Natalie and she is a primal health coach, uh, certified coach, which I also am. Um, and so I think you're great because primal health coach certifications are great. I created a course for primal health coach. No big deal. Yes, you, you should did. go take it. Okay. I got to, you know, we're allowed to talk about ourselves. It's our podcast. Yeah. I can, What's I can the do website shameless plug. That they can go to, to take that primalhealthcoach.com, I want to say. There are a number of, of certifications there. I did one that's, you know, it's very, it's quite similar in a lot of ways to our Muscle Science for Women program. It's just mm-hmm. for coaches. Um, the program you and I created is for individuals. Um, and this one's more for people who coach women to understand yeah. more about um, women. But I can put a, a link in the show notes. But Primal Health Coach, um, their like institute is a really, really good, I mean, that's why I work with them. They're really, really um thoughtful, good online certification in a world of so many and so many of them are kind of shady and not good. So anyway, mm-hmm. I'm, that's a, I'm already on a tangent, but her question's really good. She says she's a big fan of the podcast. I have questions about body types. So for anyone listening who is not familiar, we're talking about um, basically the three kind of key body types that people hear about, endomorph, mesomorph, ectomorph, which are generally characterized. And maybe we'll get into that after her question. There's three different body types. She's saying, I see ads constantly from a quote unquote celebrity trainer talking about this constantly. He says that you need to know your body type to know what road to take for your training and metabolic needs. What are your thoughts on this? So before we even talk about our thoughts, maybe it would be good to kind of just briefly overview on what like the body type sort of thing is and and what people think about it generally in the, in our industry. You want to start? (laughs) You don't have to. Um, you could do it. Uh, I believe in you. Okay. Well, I'm just going to be completely real. I just like, first of all, the red flag here is she said in quotation marks, celebrity, yeah, celebrity trainer. trainer. Okay. So yeah. first red flag is they're probably, I don't know. I'm not going to like put this out. Like this is what every celebrity trainer is like, but like that's a red flag to me. Like, okay, what are they trying to sell? Um, and do they even know what they're talking about? Um, second thing is, is I just in simple words, I think that yes, body types are a thing. Like you can, you can categorize yourself into a certain body well, type. Hold if on, you hold, would on like. hold on, hold on, hold okay. on. Let's, okay. Let's okay. I'm going to shut up. No, no, no. I just oh, want you want to talk up. about what, are the, what they are. Yeah. Cause there might be some people who are oh. like, what are you talking about? And yeah, basically, okay, sorry. so just very, very generally, and you can, you can add to this cause I'm sure with your actual um, educational background, you know more about this than I do, but it, there's generally assumed to be three basic body types, right? Yeah. There's ectomorph, right. mesomorph, and endomorph. And from the beginning to the end, from ecto tends to be people who are maybe a little bit leaner, a little bit lankier, maybe um, don't don't gain fat super easily, but also don't gain muscle super easily. This is like the, the generalized thing, right? Mm -hmm. Mesomorphs kind of in the middle, like maybe the more sort of typical, like classic physique that people maybe like, but like you can kind of gain fat. Okay. You can gain muscle pretty well. You have like a nice kind of athletic shape, I guess. And then the the endomorph on the other end is somebody who tends to be a little bit on the bigger side. People like to use very unofficial, like big boned or thicker, whatever kind of body types, Mm -hmm. Um, but they maybe gain muscle really well, but they also maybe gain fat um, easier. So um, yeah, so those are kind of like the three big kind of buckets that people like to either put themselves in or that other people like to put them in. And then maybe for marketing purposes, tell you how you train because of whatever body type you have. So that's the, the baseline. So now, okay, back to you. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. Sorry. My bad. Um, I think that I'm trying to like come up with like an analogy. And the only thing I can think about is like, uh, (laughs) and this might suck, but 
it's like, okay, yes, these are categories you can put yourself into, but you can also, so like a, maybe something that's similar of a category you put yourself into is whether you have brown hair, blonde hair, or red hair, right? Okay. So you can put yourself into those categories, but does that change how you go about brushing your hair or how you wash your hair? I mean, it might though. So it's not. Okay. Okay. Maybe, okay. Okay. But brushing your hair, okay. brushing your hair. Okay, okay, let's talk about that, right? Maybe okay, not. so brushing your hair or like, okay, yes, I'm, yeah, maybe you use a different product in your color hair, but does that change how you go about actually like scrubbing washing your it. head, mm-hmm, washing mm-hmm. it, right? Okay, mm-hmm. um, this is, are you following me with this? Or yeah, is this completely yeah. off? Okay, no, I, I, so this I is like how, yeah, so I'm like, okay, yes, you can put yourself into that category. I have, I have brown hair. Ashley has darker brown hair, right? But that doesn't change how we physically brush our hair, like the action of doing it, whatever, the action of washing your hair, right? So this is kind of, I'm trying to get at like, yes, you can categorize yourself into one of these types of body types, right? But that's not going to change how you go about focusing on the foundational things to potentially change your body type as much as it could change, right? Mm -hmm. From all the things that we talk about with nutrition, building muscle, sleeping, paying attention to your stress, like all the foundational things, right? So in my eyes, it's like if people are going to say, oh, you should eat this certain way because you are a mesomorph um, Mm -hmm. or you should train this specific way because you're an endomorph, whatever. To me, it's like that is just adding more confusion to the picture um, and you're focusing on the things that don't necessarily matter, right? Like focus on what matters, which Mm -hmm. are the foundational things. Um, And so just in plain, simple terms, I think that people who say you should do this because of your body type is complete bullshit. (laughs) Yeah, I would agree. And I would say that, I mean, obviously to your point earlier, they're doing it to have an angle to sell programs. Um, Mm -hmm. And I think at worst, what this does is, you know, we like to talk about how information is good, right? Information is power and it helps us make decisions. But there's sort of the dark side to stuff like this where someone tells you once that you're an endomorph and then for the rest of your life, you think, well, I'm just supposed to be bigger, like a way that Mm -hmm. I don't like. I can't, I can't lose fat. So this is the body type that I have. I'm big boned. This is the way I am. Or conversely, like a lot of men, I'm an ectomorph. I'm tall and lean and I just can't put on muscle no matter what I do. What's the point? It is what it is. It's very self-defeating, right? And even if you are the most quintessential looking ectomorph or endomorph in the world, you are also still way more than that. So, you know, I think about my husband, for example, who is 6'3", and his his like wingspan is like, ridiculous, right? And him doing stuff like bench pressing or like even pull-ups, it's just, it's ridiculous. He's like, it's so hard for me. My arms are so long. Like it's hard for me to build like big, juicy, you know, whatever biceps because my arms are twice the length of other people's. He would definitely classify as an ectomorph, right? But he also has a ton of other things that are going to impact what he looks like, how he trains, how he eats, like his goals and preferences, the athletic stuff he likes to do versus the stuff that maybe someone would tell him he has to do to optimize his body type. Um, And, you know, I think we all probably looking at these body types would be like, yeah, I feel like I'm probably this thing, but it's not, it shouldn't be the driving force for how you eat or exercise, right? It's just yeah. information. If you know that you're somebody who a hard gainer or whatever, and you have a really harder time, you think compared to other people, gaining fat, gaining muscle, losing fat, whatever, that's one piece of information that can help you maybe make adjustments based on what your goals are. But spending time putting yourself in this box and then trying to, you know, plan accordingly, I think is, it's just a waste of time and it just makes you kind of feel bad. Yeah. Cause yeah. Anyway. Yeah. yeah. It just like, yeah, it just, you're focusing on things that you shouldn't be focusing on basically. Yeah. Like put yeah. that energy towards the other things. Um, and yes, there's genetic component, which this is part of, I believe like, like how, you know, your genetics will put you in these types of categories. Um, but why focus on something that you can't change Uh, like from that standpoint and focus on all the things that you can potentially change Mm -hmm. and make that the priority 
Um, and yeah, that's what I would say. Yeah. Yeah. So I think uh, there's, there's really no benefit to trying to do anything based on your, on your, yeah. whatever these three body types are. It's like, just what you should focus on is what you want to do. What do you want to do mm-hmm. or improve or learn or change or optimize or whatever? Yeah. And go based on that. Thank you, Natalie, for that question. That's a good question. Yes. We've never gotten that one. When she, when she said that one. in, I was like, oh yeah, that's fun. Okay. Another question that we got a little while ago at the beginning. Well, do we want to, uh, before we answer this question, talk oh, yeah, about what you've been about- studying a little bit? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That's a good call. Good job. Thank you. Because I forget. Mm-hmm. So that's why I'm here. <laughs> that's what you're here for. Um, so I've been doing a little bit of research for some clients and actually some friends, and I won't go too far down that rabbit hole, but on gestational diabetes. And this is a complete 180 segue from what we've been talking about. (laughs) But basically it's the concept that, um, well, you're the, the, a pregnant body has a harder time regulating blood sugar. And there are some real physiological reasons why that is. One is, um, actually, I think just the simple act of being pregnant and our placenta also, which is growing obviously when we're having a baby, um, it just makes us more insulin resistant. It's like just a cool, fun thing. And there is, I should have written this down, but it's its a survival mechanism that helps kind of, again, direct everything that needs to go to the baby to the baby and kind of leave the mom mm-hmm. with whatever's left. So it's actually, it sounds like this crappy thing. Like why would we become insulin resistant and have a hard time managing blood sugar when we're pregnant? That sucks. But there is like a sort of survival reason for it that's actually quite intelligent. But it it, the result is that some women and women who are generally super, super healthy and sorted out take this blood sugar test halfway through the pregnancy and find out that they, again, quote unquote, failed it and now have to manage their blood sugar and have to change their diet and all this stuff. Um, and there are some... Um, there are some pre- like uh, criteria that make you more predisposed to, to having gestational diabetes, which is being um, older... Um, and older, I mean, like literally, you know, 35 and, and up, which a lot of people are when they're having kids these days, because the age of people getting pregnant is mm-hmm. getting a lot older these days. Um, you know, women of color um, and, you know, some pre, pre-existing issues, um, all kinds of things that can kind of make you more likely. But in reading this book, so this book, Real Food for Gestational Diabetes by Dr. Lily Nichols, anybody who's mm-hmm. sort of been pregnant and cares about healthy eating, knows about her. She's been all over the place. She's written a number of books and they're all really, really good. Uh, But one of the things she says too is that um, you could have literally zero of these criteria and still have gestational diabetes or like pre-gestational diabetes. And it can be really upsetting and it can be really scary because there's these potential sort of downsides of having a, a very large baby, which can um, complicate the delivery and there can be some health implications for the mother and the kid. If it's something that isn't sort of managed during pregnancy, um, it also makes the mother more likely to get type two diabetes later in life, just in general, if you have it while you're pregnant. So anyway, I'm not trying to be super scary. It's just something I'm researching, um, Mm -hmm. and learning a lot about. And so the segue, the beautiful segue here is that if this is something that you are concerned about, if you are looking to get pregnant, if you are pregnant and you just kind of want to get on top of this stuff, um, a CGM, a, a continuous glucose monitor, is a great proactive way to pay attention to your blood sugar and to um, see if there are foods that are maybe impacting you differently than you thought or impacting you differently since you've been pregnant. Um, I will mm-hmm. say also that blood sugar, healthy blood sugar levels are different when you're pregnant than when you're not. So you're going to want to do your research, maybe check out this book. I'll put a link to it in the show notes um, because she has all the numbers and stuff, but it you need to know this because your blood is diluted when you're pregnant. Your blood volume goes way up so that the values mm-hmm. are going to be different. So you need to know that. But um, Anyway, so NutriSense is our sponsor, and we've been, you and I, have been experimenting with the CGMs and with their app, um, which just kind of gives you all the information in one place and helps you track the stuff really um, neatly and easily. And so it may be a resource that you would want to think about, like Mm -hmm. I said, if you're pregnant or thinking about getting pregnant, because it's something that definitely matters. It's definitely impactful, and you don't 
really want it to kind of sneak up on you, it would be great if you can be sort of monitoring and paying attention to the stuff mm-hmm. on your own rather than having a doctor make you drink, you know, uh, 18 yeah. ounces of sugar and then tell you you didn't mm-hmm. handle it well. It's like, yeah, duh, yeah. like this sucks. Um, so anyway, <laughs> yeah. um, it's just something I've been thinking about. And if you guys are, are hearing this and you're like, I'm really interested in this, let us know. We can do some more research, do some more deep dives. Maybe mm-hmm. we can get... Um, Lily on the podcast, if you want to have her on talking about some stuff. We don't have a lot of guests these days, but sometimes people are special and worth it. So yeah. um, let us know what you think about that. But if it's something that you're interested in, um, definitely NutriSense is a, an excellent road to go because mm-hmm. they have um, nutritionist support that, you know, they can talk to you through these yeah. things. There's tons and tons of resources. And at the very least, it just shows you, you've got this super simple app that you, and you have the CGM constantly. You can be experimenting with things and trying things and it gives you real time information, um, how yeah. you're handling stuff. So. Yeah. And these nutritionists, yeah. Like the ones who work with the app um, and with the CGM, like they can help with, like you said, when your pregnant numbers are different. So mm-hmm. that's like, literally their job is to like help you with understand what the numbers mm-hmm. are telling you. And of course, um, be knowledgeable in that sense. So it's not like you're yeah. going out, going about it alone either. So that's yes. what's cool too. Yes, absolutely. So we'll put the link, our, our dedicated link in the show notes, but you can also just remember if you want to go to the NutriSense website and just do it yourself, our code is simple. It's MSW and you get $30 off your first month because it's basically the app subscription is what you're paying for. Mm-hmm. Um, and with that that first month, you also get two CGM, the sensors that you're going to put on your body. You get free shipping and you get a the first month, um, you get the nutritionist support for free just additionally with your um, subscription. So that's actually a pretty good deal. And that's a month is plenty of time for you to really start like setting some baselines and some understanding around, mm-hmm. you know, how your blood sugar is working for you. So, um, so that's that NutriSense, good stuff. And um, what's the website again? It's in the link in the show notes, but yeah, it's NutriSenseIO.com forward slash MSW. Okay. Yeah. Cool. Cool. All right. Moving Sweet. on. So sh- yeah, we're going to do that next question. Yes. Yeah, so this question, we, I think it just kind of got lost in the the pile, um, but it's topical for the winter. So we're going to get yes. into it. Um, <clears throat> do you Deborah, want me to read it? Yeah, you can read it. Why don't you I feel like it? I've not read any because I like to you're better read at them. it, but no, no I like to read I know. them. No, go for it. <laughs> um, yeah. Sorry. Sometimes, and this is something just to point out to you, sometimes um, you know, as this happens from a lot of people too, emails can go to spam or they go to junk or they just get missed. So if you've sent us a question and we haven't gotten to it, like within a few weeks, um, just send it again. Right. Yeah. Uh, Cause sometimes some things get missed. So apologies, you know, if, if that happened, especially around the holidays, I think a few, few got missed, but, um, or ended up in spam, but we found a few and Deborah had a question about, um, snowboarding yes or skiing so she said hi i love your podcast my question is how to strength train if you're a snowboarder or a skier assuming i'm going to snowboard every saturday what would you recommend for workouts during the week um and she said she gave us some notes on some of the things that she has available um i'm not gonna read all of this but yeah that's a it's a good question because i think Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people do that and cool sports. snowboarding skiing is hard. It's a, that's a workout, right? You are yeah. absolutely using your muscle, your leg muscles. Um, mm-hmm. and it can burn. Do you, do you ski or snowboard or both? So I grew up skiing. Um, yeah. We've talked I haven't, this, I think. yeah, I haven't done it regularly in a few, in a few years. Um, I do want to get back into it a little bit, but, um, I know when I was doing it, like I was, it was a workout. <laughs> um, well, I was definitely sore after. and But I do work with a, a bunch of my clients are actually ski, skiers and snowboarders. Um, so this is something that I've, I've worked through. Yeah. I mean, I, I love skiing. I've never snowboarded. I started learning skiing when I was like three years old and I just kind of stuck to mm-hmm. it. And I love it. I love it as a form of exercise because it's one of those things that you are not thinking it's exercise at the time. You know, like sometimes, I mean, people like us who go to the gym because we love it, but like we know we're going there to exercise, yeah. to work out. But I kind of love 
doing something that's just a fun activity. And then the next day you're like, oh my God, I got like such a good workout. Like you're not thinking about it at yeah. the time because you're too busy trying not to like run into a tree and stay yeah. upright and whatever. Um, I love skiing. And actually this is, this is kind of an interesting timing because I literally just took my son to the ski hill for the first time. He is two and a half. So he's a little on the young side and he's not, he, he's not the best with stability. Um, that's definitely something we need to work on. He's a little bit, I used to say it was just like, cause he's kind of just tall and willowy. So he's just a little like, you know, he's just kind of swaying in the breeze a little bit. I don't think he has like the best balance for a two and a half year old. Um, but we really want to, we want this to be a part of our life. Like we love skiing and we want to get him started and have fun and find ways to enjoy the winter because when you live in this weather, you need to. Um, so mm. we just took him to the hill for the first time and he did pretty good. And I would say Alex, I mean, he had to take him on like the little bunny hill, you know, like the little training yeah. hill. And the whole time he's bent over sideways, like holding him up, like between his legs. So I'm like, that's a good workout. If you want to add that to yeah. your <laughs> regimen, just holding like a, well, with all the equipment, like a 50 pound kid, like, you know, while you try to ski and stay upright. Yeah. <sighs> anyway, it's a great sport. It's super fun. I can't wait to do more of it myself because I've been kind of off of it for a while, but I love it. Um, anyway, so she's asking how to strength train. So we're assuming that you want to strength train to support your hobby of snowboarding and skiing. So you want to have strong core, I think would be very important and strong lower body. Um, of course, we don't want to to neglect upper body. That's always still important. Mm -hmm. And I think that probably the things you want to focus on, like I don't work with anybody specifically who's a skier or a snowboarder. So maybe Rachel can give a bit more context for this, but I think what you want to do is focus on not overdoing it to the point where you feel burnt out and can't enjoy the sport. That's the main thing you want to be doing. Like if your thing is snowboarding, you don't want to be crushing five leg days a week so that on the, when the Saturday rolls around, you're exhausted and sore, right? You want to support the sport you're doing, not take away from it. Mm -hmm. um, she's saying, I like to take two full rest days a week, at least. That sounds great. Um, uh, what else? Yeah, so I mean, I would just say like functional, you know, our even our glute program would probably be really good because mm -hmm. our glute workshop is actually lower body just with a glute focus. Um, but focus on you know, functional um, strength training, lower body, that's also going to incorporate core because goodness knows if you've been doing um, single leg bilateral work, if you're doing like split squats, if you're doing deadlifts, mm -hmm. you're doing anything that's all core work too. Um, what are your thoughts? Yeah. No, I agree. I mean, I think, I don't know. I am like starting to not love the word functional because I feel like all if like if you're following a program that's a legit program like it's all going to be functional yeah you know but lots of people like aren't following a legit program well, that's what i'm saying so like yeah. if you follow our program it's functional <laughs> sure <laughs> even sure. if it's focused on building muscle if it's a good program that's incorporating all the different muscle groups in different ways that you know you need to do um and if someone who is educated on these things is developing that program which we yeah. are um you will be hitting all the functional realm that you need maybe to. thoughtful is a better word because even that people will be like, well, of course I'm being thoughtful. Like I'm asking you the question, but tons of people, myself included, remember we had this conversation like a couple podcasts ago where I'm like, I'm not being very thoughtful. I'm showing up and kind of like yeah. doing some stuff, but I'm not being very thoughtful in terms of like yeah. what my goals or what I want my progress to be. And a lot of people are like that. And maybe this is why mm -hmm. Deborah's messaging us too. Cause she's like, you know, I go for long walks with my dog and I have a Peloton and I'm kind of just doing whatever. So maybe, you know, it's not super thoughtful. So yeah, yeah. maybe that's a better way to look at it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I think, again, the general scope here, and again, I do work with clients who do, you know, ski and snowboarding, especially um, they're kind of like the weekend, you know, you know, during the months of January through or December through March or whatever the months of skiing and snowboarding are um, like almost every weekend, like on a Saturday, they'll go out and, and do that, um, which is a, a workout in itself. Right. So um, it's just kind of being able to balance that and find, you know, what works for you in the sense of like, okay, are, do you have enough time to recover between your skiing or snowboarding days and your dedicated leg day or lower body day? Um, everybody's different. I have some clients who it's like, okay, we actually have to, we actually need to just train 
lower body once a week, you know, maybe again, usually people are over the weekend. So if it's Saturday, then we'll train lower body on Tuesday or Wednesday to give enough buffer between that, that weekend. Um, and that's really all they can handle because they're going, you know, all out on that Saturday. So it's kind of like a leg day. Obviously you're, you're using your muscles in different ways than you would traditionally through like squats and deadlifts and things like that, but you're still using them. And so we have to find that balance. Right. Um, and then maybe, you know, the rest of the year you're back to your two lower body days. Right. You know? Um, so that's one thing, like maybe it's like, okay, we need to just back down and do one dedicated lower body day of training during the week. And then you have that Saturday to do the skiing or snowboarding. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's other clients who they recover faster um, and they can do two lower body days. And maybe one day is um, a bit uh, more intense than another, right? So maybe they're getting more intense on that Tuesday or Wednesday leg day. Um, maybe if they do it Tuesday and then maybe Friday, the day before they go on their snowboarding, they're doing, they're backing off a little bit, not going like super, super hard, not taking things all the way to failure, so to speak. Um, but they're still working through those ranges of motion, maybe um, doing specific like unilateral work or single leg work to help with that. Um, but I would say just in general for skiing and snowboarding, you want all around strong glutes, quads, hamstrings to support the movement, right? And that's just going to come back to again, like if you're following a smart strategic program, you're going to be doing those movements that are building strong glutes, quads, hamstrings, calves, um, strong and, you know, obviously functional. Mm -hmm. And that in itself is just going to be, it's going to translate to that, right? Because especially like thinking about knee health, right? Mm. Joint health, knee health, making sure that you are stable through that, that's going to be a lot of just making sure that the surrounding muscles are strong, right? If you want your knees to be healthy, you should be focusing on training your quads, train your hamstrings, calves, um, doing things like knees over toes, you know, making sure that you were getting good range of motion. So doing like, you know, we have in our program, you know, split squats or like uh, front foot elevated split squats where you're really focusing on pushing your knee over your toe, which is something that a lot of people are scared to do or have heard mm -hmm. bad things about, but that's actually not true. If you actually are doing it in a way that, um, like, you know how to do it and you're focusing on the right things, you can really gain a lot of great functionality, muscle protection of your ligaments, joints, all of that stuff through doing that. Mm -hmm. Um, so yeah, I think it's just comes back to like, assessing where you're at, how much you can recover from, um, and, you know, just being smart about it. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. And I mean, you also, she didn't mention this, but I think I'm not a snowboarder, but I feel like snowboarding has a little bit more like imbalance built into it than skiing, like skiing, you're on two skis, your yeah. legs are moving independently. You're kind of moving, like you're facing down the hill and going, to, whereas snowboarding, you've got yeah. like one leg off, you've got a lead leg, you've got this, you know, so there could potentially be some like overuse, repetitive mobility sort of stuff that comes from mm -hmm. snowboarding. That's, that's unique. You know, you have a full day of snowboarding and, you know, after every time your right knee is super sore or you're like lower back on one side or whatever, those are things mm -hmm. to pay attention to too. And, you know, she was saying she does some yoga, but maybe some like some proactive kind of mobility, rest, stretching stuff that's kind of supports yeah. that would be um, really good too. Yeah. And really focusing, I would say with that too, really focusing on incorporating unilateral movements into mm -hmm. your programming. We talk a lot about that, obviously in Muscle Science Warrant, but we talk a lot about that in our Grow Your Glutes program um, mm -hmm. and how to incorporate, uh, we, we give like so many different examples of unilateral movements, not just for glutes, but also um, overall lower body. Um, so I think that's important too, because I, I also think just in general, that's very overlooked. Um, like if you're following a program and you don't have like you should be doing at least one unilateral, which just means you're doing one leg at a time every single week, if not more than that um, in your programming. So like a single leg squat, a lunge, a step up, a single leg hamstring curl or leg extension, whatever. But if you're not like that's something that you should pay attention to because we all have imbalances. We most people, 90, I would say 95 plus percent of people are going to have one leg that's stronger than the other. And that's just how we are built because we, yeah. you know, We're not are symmetrical. more dominant. 
Yeah. We're not symmetrical. Yeah. And that's normal. It's normal. That mm-hmm. that's not like something that's bad, but it can lead to, like you said, overuse or um, favoring one side of th- one side over the other that then can lead to some imbalance. And if you're not paying attention to that, then it could, you know, go up the chain and, and cause some issues over mm-hmm. time, which I've experienced myself with my my lower back um, from that specific thing. So Yes, and I experienced yeah. with my recent foray into running where every time I ran more than 8K, my left, like high, high hamstring slash glute was like, no, 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 no. Don't, don't do it, don't do it. And I did it. Um, anybody who's listening, if you don't have a noticeable imbalance, if you feel like you, you're, you know, single leg, your split squat, whatever, if they feel the same on both sides, if you don't have, uh, some kind of chronic little twinge or pain on one side more than the other, let us know because I want to know what your secret is or why you're the chosen yeah. one <laughs> because I feel like that is very, very rare. And I want to know what you're doing that we're not doing. Um, speaking of, this made me realize, um, we were talking about our glute program, that we should probably just tease for the heck of it that we are working on yet another program, a workshop that we are going to be introducing to the Muscle Science for Women suite of products for you. Mm -hmm. Um, We've been kind of averaging like a one program a year uh, launch, and we're kind of coming up on another one that we've been working on that is, um, I don't know if we have to say what it is, but it's basically in response to what you guys said you wanted. You said first and foremost, glutes and lower body, and we're doing the next one, and I'm very excited about it. I think it's going to be great, Mm -hmm. and um, I'm just really excited to get that out in the next couple months, so everybody stay tuned. Yes, stay tuned. We'll be putting out more information about that. I'm excited. (sighs) Yeah. Yeah. If anybody wants just a teaser of what what body part specific or what area it is, all you if you know me, if you've been following me and listening <laughs> to me for a long time, you know I'm very excited about it. You can just kind of get a guess, a general guess. It's not calves, okay? We'll just say that. <laughs> We're not doing calves. So j- just so you know. Anyway, maybe someday oh, if you really want it, but uh, I don't think so. Um, Mm, all right. Well, I guess that's it. Is there anything else you want to share with our lovely Uh, listeners until next time? No, I think we're good. We do have some other questions in the queue that we'll be recording for next time. Um, but I think, I think that's it today. Um, I don't know. One other thing, because you're really good at, yeah, well, you're good at like, um, reminding us to like plug our podcast and tell people to share it and rate Mm -hmm. and review and all of those things, which we need to do more of on our own podcast. We can promote. I just want to say if anyone's still listening, you should be signing up for both of our newsletters. If you aren't already, I still like, I talk to Rachel all the time. I still open her newsletters. I still look at whatever, you know, she's so consistent. You read the Friday flex. Always, always. There's always a good recipe in there. That makes me happy. Sometimes you're talking about <laughs> our podcast. So that's nice. You know, you put whatever we're, we're talking about, but you're, you're very consistent. You always have stuff that's valuable to people. So if you aren't subscribed, you should. It's just a good resource to have. And the reason why I'm thinking of it is because I used to be super consistent and on top of newsletters and I fell off for a while. And I'm starting to think about really kind of redirecting a lot of my current social media energy to a newsletter instead. And I just um, like put out one a week ago that was much more- I saw that. I got that too. See, there you go. It's a little bit more like Mm -hmm. long form. It's a little bit more thoughtful. And I've been getting some really cool feedback from people. Um, I know that not everyone's going to want another newsletter. And I know sometimes people don't have the bandwidth to read more than a couple sentences or whatever. But I think that I do think sometimes people, I know I am, we're kind of missing a little bit more deep uh, engagement or interaction, right? And Mm -hmm. who knows what's going to happen if we're all someday just going to say F it and get off Instagram. We don't know what the future holds. Um, And so I really am just trying to like find more meaningful ways to share stuff and maybe Mm -hmm. have a community. I'm putting a little bit more effort and a little bit more thought into a newsletter. And I want Anybody who likes what we do and likes what we share, um, just consider sort of supporting us that way. We don't spam you. It's it's all killer, no filler. So subscribe to our <laughs> newsletter. That. Yeah, go to our website. Subscribe to our newsletter. Yes. It's what good. is the? We'll put these in the in the show notes. But what's your 
yeah, specific link for your website. Newsletter. It's just ashleyvanhouten.com and you just quick scroll to the bottom and you, it'll say subscribe. You just put your email in. Okay. Yeah. Well, mine is rgfit.com backslash or forward slash whatever the slash is. That's the normal forward slash. probably <laughs> forward slash rgfit.com forward slash newsletter. Um, that will take you to like directly there to the sign up page. Um, and yeah, I think also like, I don't know. I put a lot of effort into my newsletter. Mm -hmm. It goes out every Friday. It's called the Friday Flex. And I feel like there's a lot of just like information, like free information in there. If you follow a good newsletter, I follow a few people's like newsletters each week. And the the free information, it's like, wow, this is this Mm -hmm. is stuff that like is legit. It's not Mm -hmm. just like, oh, here's a bunch of random crap. It's like, Mm -hmm. no, this is legit information that is cool to have. Right. So. So, yeah. I mean, there's no reason not to, and you can always unsubscribe if you want or not, not open it. Um, but a good good newsletter will at the very least, like give you some resources, like maybe you're bored and you need a something, a new podcast to listen to. Maybe you need a new recipe and you aren't Mm -hmm. feeling inspired. And at the best sometimes, because I follow a handful too, that I read always, they can really be maybe inspiring, can like make you think in a different way or whatever. Mm -hmm. That's the hope. So again, I think we're, we're all very used to this, um, really passive, not very engaging way of, of connecting quote unquote on social media that I feel like most of us actually don't really love and aren't super, we're kind of disillusioned by. And I know some of us, you know, there's good things about social media and we're all on there and like there can be benefits and there is community. But I think if you're looking for other ways to just maybe have a bit of a better connection, sometimes, at least I think in our case, a good newsletter, it can be that because you can respond to us. Like I have people personally yeah. responding and saying like, Hey, that was really cool. I liked this. Here's a book suggestion, whatever you can have it. You can build communities in other ways that feel better than social media feels. So it's just, you know, something to think about. Absolutely. All right. And agree more on that note. I'm going to go hydrate my body because cool. I'm going to go eat. I have not drunk Again. a liquid in many hours. Go drunk, go drunk, drink <laughs> drunk a liquid. <laughs> go drunk a liquid. <laughs> I'm on it. All right. Until okay. next time. Don't be insane. Don't do stupid shit. Drink your liquids. <laughs>